So dementia, oh my gosh, you know, this is kind of a scary talk to come to, but um, I think it's good to have knowledge of things and then as well to, um, yeah, come on in and have a seat. Uh, many of us are dealing with that in our family members. And so I'm, I'm giving us a high level perspective tonight. And if you have questions, you know, I'll try to answer those. I just don't want you to think I'm going to, going to take a deep dive into medical stuff that is hard to understand sometimes, um, when, especially when it's related to dementia. This is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to examine the prevalence of dementia, review the types of dementia, and then understand prevention and therapies and kind of talk about caregiver stress a little bit and those kinds of things. Um, so here's some demographics for you that are frightening if you actually think about it. Um, Think about this in light of the baby boomers that are now, I mean, I'm, I just missed that cutoff by like two years, but my husband's a baby boomer. And so overwhelming the country, right, with people over 65 and over. Um, dementia in general, and we're going to talk about dementia versus Alzheimer, Alzheimer's, um, is the fifth most common cause of death for Americans older than 65. And a lot of times people who have dementia when they die, they die of pneumonia or they die of some type of an infection or something like this. So that might be really what's on the death certificate and not so much dementia, but dementia would be the kind of underlying greater cause of their death. Uh, in 2017, 16, 6.1 million people are living with dementia or mild cognitive impairment. And by 2060, that burden will increase and triple to about 14 million people. And that has to do with the aging of the population, of course. Um, Americans greater than 65 are expected to double in number by 2060, which fits into that uh, large number of dementia patients. And then this is interesting, and we'll talk about this again a little more in a minute. By 2060, minorities over the age of 65 will represent 45% of the population. And I'll tell you why that's important when we get to the slide after this one. So thinking about dementia and all that that entails, you can think about the economy of the U.S. and how that's going to be impacted now, between now and 2060. We have fewer children being born. I think the average American couple has, one. I think it's 1.9, might be 1.6 children. Yet we have all these people that are aging that are going to need care. And we already have, it seems like we're always in a nursing shortage, but we, we definitely have one in the long-term care facilities right now. Um, the national cost, this is as of 2017, $259 billion were paid out for health care, long-term care, and um, hospice care for dementia patients. That's 2017. In 2016, caregivers such as family members, people that were unpaid, if you assigned a dollar amount to that, they would have, that would have been another $260 billion uh, in care that was provided. So by 2050, going forward 30 years, we're expected to pay out more than $1.1 trillion just for dementia care. It's like, boy, how does our healthcare system sustain that? And I, I don't have a good answer. I will tell you what is on the horizon. This is off topic, but what is on the horizon is robotics. Robot, robots providing your, helping you do your activities of daily living um, in the homes even. There's a, there's, that's happening in Japan where they have a huge shortage of healthcare providers. So you might want to check into that. Very interesting research on it. Um, Going back to that first slide where we talked about uh, Hispanics, um, the minorities becoming 45% of that aging population, look at this. This is why it's important because when you think about dementia, uh, this is from the CDC, it's estimated, pretty close numbers, that 14% of people with dementia are African American. 12% are Hispanic, 10% are um, Caucasian. And there's another 17% where like Pacific Islanders and Asians and American Indians fit in. So that equals the total population of uh, dementia patients. And if you think about that, 5 million people in 2014 when this slide was created, 
an estimated 14 million in 2060. And so why is it that African Americans and Hispanics, especially Hispanics, are gonna make up this large proportion of dementia patients? And that is because of the chronic disease. Um, there's, there's something called social determinants of health that, such as where you live, the health care you have access to, the food you eat, um, housing, things like this, that determine, in large part, your state of health. And largely, Hispanics, African Americans, they live in the inner cities, they have poorer diets, they have less access to health care, so they have more chronic disease. The thing is, though, that we're, we're having more Hispanics come into the country, but they're living longer now. We all live longer with chronic disease because we, we better manage diabetes and hypertension and hyperlipidemia, so we live to be a lot older. And now we're all developing dementia. You know, when the average lifespan used to be, what, 65? You, you say, oh, they're senile. You know, we didn't have that term dementia. Now the average lifespan is about 80. For men, men, uh, men are a little bit shorter than that, but for women, definitely about 80. And there's, there's more octogenarians, I think that's, you know, it's not, uh, cent centurions, what is the word, you guys? 100 year olds, <laughs> centurions. I was saying octo would be eight, uh, it, than ever before. I can't tell you when I'm around at the nursing home how many people are 100 years old. And many of them actually are doing pretty well. You know, some of them are, most of the ones that I know that are 100 really weren't demented. They're just, their body has failed them, you know, but their mind's still good. So, I, I think this is important to think about. Um, I have patients that will say, or family members largely, that'll say, well, uh, my mother has Alzheimer's, but she doesn't have, I'm glad she doesn't have dementia. And I'm like, not understanding that dementia is the overall umbrella term. And there's different types of dementia that fall under that umbrella, with Alzheimer's being the most common. About 75 to 80% of dementias are Alzheimer's. Uh, but then that is followed by vascular dementia, we'll talk about a little bit, as the number two cause of dementia. Uh, Parkinson's disease is next. Something called frontotemporal dementia, we'll talk about that, that hits people at an early age, like about 50 sometimes. Uh, Huntington's disease has a form of dementia with it. And we mixed disease. Mixed means, so people with vascular dementia will usually also have Alzheimer's dementia. You can have Alzheimer's with any of these, uh, but the underlying disease is usually what drives it. For example, um, if you have a person with vascular dementia and Alzheimer's, the vascular dementia, dementia when they get further along, can make them more aggressive with their behaviors, more um, agitated, versus a true Alzheimer's patient. It's usually very calm and very sweet, and they just don't know what's going on, but they're not aggressive generally. So that's why I say most dementias tend to be mixed. There's no way to really know that, and, I'll, and I'll, you'll see that as we talk about uh, diagnosing this, but to diagnose Alzheimer's, you have to have a brain biopsy. You don't do that on living people. So it's, it's we'll talk about, talk about that a little bit going forward. Um, I want to I want to really spend some time on Alzheimer's, and talk a little bit about what that looks like, medically speaking. So it is a progressive, life-ending disease. People do not survive um, Alzheimer's. We we help people to live as well as they can through it. Hopefully, it's a very hard disease to live through. On probably more on the family members, if any of you are dealing with that than on the patient themselves. <coughs> it affects memory, reasoning, judgment and decision making, planning, their mood, their, their personality, their behaviors. Um, the brain tissue in, in a dementia patient, but Alzheimer's specifically right now, has fewer nerve connections and that's why all these things happen that I just mentioned. They don't have the neurological connections to form their memories and to think and to plan and to understand why they just acted this way. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, and the total brain size actually shrinks. Now it's normal 
as we all age, if you MRI a 80 year old who's completely healthy and a 20 year old who's completely healthy, you're gonna have less brain mass in an 80 year old than a 20 year old, but the structure of it in a normal 80 year old without dementia or strokes or anything like that, the structure is gonna look essentially the same. It's just generally the size is a little bit smaller. And I'm gonna show you some pictures in a minute. Um, there are three stages of Alzheimer's. There's early, I, I know them as early, middle, and late. Each of those stages, early has three stages itself. So does middle, and so does late. And I'm not gonna go into all that detail because you don't need to know it at that level, but when we think of somebody with mild Alzheimer's, these are people, they might still be working, they're forgetful, um, but they're forgetful in a way that is different than people without Alzheimer's or without dementia, just kind of, they're, you know, we all have normal forgetfulness. Oh, I forgot that, let me go back to the house and get it. A patient with Alzheimer's, they often aren't bothered by their forgetfulness. Their family members start to notice it. Their family member might say, hey, um, I think we need to go get you checked. I'm noticing that you're really forgetful. But the Alzheimer's patient, it just doesn't bother them. They just don't really realize it. Um, they're losing valuables. They're having trouble planning and organizing things, taking care of a checkbook. You'll see that um, start to become a problem. Um, family and friends started, again, start to notice that something is wrong. And then forgetting the normal path of how they get home from work or places that they've always gone, they can't remember how to get there, so they get lost. That is a hallmark sign. And this is a really hard, I think, for families. This and maybe even the early middle stage because you can kind of rationalize in your mind the things that are, they're doing. I think of my grandmother when she was, um, you know, past probably late, early, early middle stage. And she would say and do things that were like, well, I think something wrong is wrong with Granny. And then we talk about, well, I don't know, that might make sense. You know, and so time goes on, right, and things get worse. And then by the time sometimes family acts, the money's gone. You know, they've cleared out their bank account. They've done some crazy things because we all just aren't sure is there really a problem or not. How many of you, are, how many of you experience something like that? Have any of you? I worked with a physician who had Parkinson's disease. And when I first started working with him, he was about 60, 62, and very early, you know, and he handled it very well. But after about four years, he was making mistakes. He was coming, he would come in from lunch and go straight to his desk, and he would look like he had been through a whirlwind. Like he would, I, I don't like, what happened to him? His hair's all messed up, and he's frantically working the stock markets. Um, and he lost all of their money in the stock markets. He actually did have dementia, uh, Lewy body dementia from Parkinson's disease. And I had to call up one of the other physicians in the practice and say, um, I think somebody needs to check Dr. McKinney. He's making patient mistakes. And so uh, within a matter of two weeks, he was taken out of his practice. And it was a really hard thing to do because he was a very loved doctor in the community, you know. But sometimes you have to do hard things. Um, when we move on to the middle stage, this stage lasts a long time, okay? This is where most people hang out with their dementia when they're at home, for sure. These are the people who are forgetful about their own history, unless the memories are kind of more remote, you know, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, they're moody, they're withdrawn, they're apathetic, they don't really get excited, they're kind of a flat facial expression. Um, they can become angry and agitated at times. They don't sleep well. So maybe they're up all night or they're sleeping two or three hours a night. They're wandering. This is where family members really have to make tough decisions when these uh, families' uh, members are at home because wandering, um, leaving the stove on and forgetting to turn it off, these things are dangerous. Still being able to drive, have the keys to the car, right? because it's hard for family members to take those keys away. And um, sometimes they have a good day and you think, oh boy, well, maybe they're still okay to drive. And then they'll have a bad day. You know, depending on what stage of the middle stage they're in. 
it's, it's very challenging, but um, I think what family members have to do, which is the hard work, is to really even maybe get somebody else to objectively say, no, they're not safe to drive. No, they're not safe to stay home alone. So either somebody has to be with them 24 seven, or they need to go to like adult daycare while, while you're at work. Or if, if you can't, have, maybe the behaviors are so bad that the caregiver, the wife, the husband, can't handle them themselves. Um, and, and now they need to go to um, an extended care facility. And this is the really hard part, is that delusions can happen. So say that, like my grandmother, she believed that people were stealing her money. That's very common. You will not talk them out of that. They believe it. It's real in their mind. It doesn't matter how long you rationalize with them. You will not change their mind, and they just get angry, and you get angry. And so you just have to kind of divert them, and you start talking about something else. Um, affairs. A spouse will accuse the other spouse of having an affair. They believe it. My grandmother at one point would call us up and say, I know there's been a woman in the house. I see her high heel marks in the carpet, and I smell her perfume around the flower beds. And we're like, my, my, uh, my father called up his dad and said, Dad, this is what mom is saying. No, of course not. I mean, my grandfather was like 85 years old. You know, but still my dad in his mind thought, well, maybe something is, you know. So anyway. Um, Hand wringing and yeah, sitting there and just playing with um, paper, uh, tissues and pulling them apart. Just constant repetitive behaviors. Being in a wheelchair and constantly wanting to get up, get up, get up. You know, like you almost want to tie them down, but you can't do that. So a lot of repetitive behaviors, chanting the same thing over and over and over and over again. Those are all part of this middle stage of dementia. And then we have the late stage. And this is the late stage basically where they are bed bound. They, um, they're really not communicating anymore. They need, to, they need total care. And most dementia patients at this point will end up uh, in an extended care facility. Sometimes even at that late middle stage when the behaviors are so bad and the family member is so tired and the family just hasn't wanted to face what needs to happen, so they end up in an emergency room and, and then they stay there for a day or so until somebody can emergently find them a place to go because it's so hard. And I think if we were more educated on this, maybe it would be easier to think further ahead and, and kind of plan. It's, it's really causes more confusion for a, a person to, they do become confused if they go from home to an extended care facility, they're gonna be confused. They're gonna be a little bit worse for a period of time, several weeks. But if the family member gets frustrated and takes them out and takes them back home, that's confusion again. Any change is very confusing for them. Um, anyway, this is, this is where they're at risk for infections because they might aspirate as they're trying to eat or drink. Uh, they're probably not eating or drinking much at this point. Um, they're, they aren't able to walk, sit, um, at that late middle stage or early severe, they might be in one of those jerry chairs where they're kind of laid back and they're having to be fed and it's just really hard to feed them too. Um, any questions so far? Any comments you guys want to make? I mean, you might have experiences with this that you want to share. Well, I have questions. You just had the middle was the years. Uh -huh. So how long is the early and I mean the late, I, from my experience, with that went pretty quick. But that middle stage, that middle stage can be five years, six years. But the early stage? The early stage, it depends when it's recognized. That's the problem. Okay. So it could be maybe once it's recognized, maybe things move kind of quickly because it's that late early well, stage, maybe stage six months. Anyway. Yeah, the, and the long-term memories will stay. People they've known for a long time, people, things that uh, their wedding, the birthday parties, aunts and uncles and grandparents, those memories stay almost, for some people, as long as they can still talk. Um, but for other, it, and it, it varies. So I'm, I'm giving you like kind of the average, but there's differences in people. 
and some people very quickly forget who their daughter is. So it's hard to diagnose, first of all. So family member, somebody's got to realize there's a problem, first of all. Sometimes it's the health care provider, right? Um, I, ha I had a patient years ago who came in. Mabel was about, I don't know, 75 to 80. Her husband was a little older. He usually came in because he was the one that was sick, but they lived alone. But, she, you know, Mabel would come in about once every six months to get her blood pressure medicine refilled. And I was new to the practice. I really didn't know her very well. But she was a really dressy lady when I started seeing her. And then about six months went by, and Mabel was just kind of different, but I couldn't put my hand, my finger on it. Other kids lived away. Um, but then what I saw, she started becoming disheveled when she came in. Her clothes were dirty, and maybe her lipstick was on crooked, or her hair wasn't done. I'm like, wow. So I was talking to my nurse who lived in the community, and uh, I'm sure Mabel had uh, dementia. But it was a really tough situation. I left that practice before um, Mabel got to a late, late stage. So she was still living in the home. But one day she came in and I'm like, Mabel, how are you doing today? And she goes, well, I'm pretty good. I can't remember anything I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a great statement? You know, she was probably in that middle stage then. Um, so so it's, it's more recognition. But if you come in, like I said, diagnosis, definitive diagnosis for Alzheimer's is a brain biopsy, which nobody's going to get until they're dead, and most people don't get it then, <coughs> unless for research purposes, because why would you, why you're going to want that on a family member? Um, so you could have a neuropsychologist evaluation. You could say to your family nurse practitioner or physician, say, boy, I'm really worried about so-and-so, or myself. Like, I was really worried about myself last year, and I'm like, I keep forgetting things. I know that I'm forgetting things, but still, like, I, maybe something's wrong with me. And I went to a neuropsychologist, and so she did an evaluation with me. Now, I didn't go through a whole battery of tests because her evaluation over about an hour, she's like, you know what? You're a busy person. You're under a lot of stress, even though it's good stress. You're doing 10 million different things. You've got normal forgetfulness. I'm not worried about you. Um, but my mother, on the other hand, uh, I was worried about her. She wasn't worried about herself. But she had changes in behavior, um, forgetting things I didn't think she should forget. And she wasn't like, she would always make an excuse, you know. And so I took her in, and she has mild cognitive impairment. She went through about four hours of testing in that office. And then uh, it all got evaluated, and we go back the next day, or a week later, I think it was, and got the uh, diagnosis. And my mom was really, really angry. Like, she didn't even want it. She won't go back. I can't get her to go back now. It's been a year and a half for another evaluation to see where she is, so we don't. Um, she still lives on her own and does her own thing, but I take care of her finances. I make decisions uh, for her along with when she can make them, you know, we do it together. But if she can't, I, I do that, and she's acknowledged that. But mild cognitive impairment is kind of the precursor for most people to dementia. We used to think that most people didn't go on to develop dementia, but, but now what we're finding out through the research is a large percentage do, probably about 70, 75% go on to develop dementia. Anyway, so you can have the neuropsychologist evaluation. You can, um, if you came into my office and said, you brought your father and I'm really concerned, um, I want him to be evaluated for uh, dementia, you're probably not going to say that to me. You're probably going to say his memory's not right, he's just not doing things quite right. And that can be a tough visit because he's probably going to be mad. And he's going to be making all kinds of excuses. I don't know why you've got me here. And I'm going to say, you know what, let's just do some lab work. So you do some basic lab work. You check the thyroid, you check the B12 level, you check uh, for syphilis, believe it or not, because it can have late stage mental uh, effects. HIV, you do a blood count looking for anemia, anything else that could explain behavior changes, forgetfulness, things like this, sleep problems. So when all that comes back normal and you put this together with the age and you put this together with what the family member's describing, then you're, you're coming up with, wow, this kind of looks like dementia. Now, what form? If they've not had strokes, and there's no Parkinson's disease, and there's no Huntington's disease, probably going to be Alzheimer's, you know? Um, you can do imaging, and image CT will help. MRI maybe will help. They're about the same f uh, fruitfulness when you do that. Kind of rule, I'm really ruling out 
other things. I'm ruling out a brain tumor. I'm, I'm ruling out things so that I can now say it's this because there's not a test for Alzheimer's. Another uh, kind of quick screening that most of us do in practice is called the clock draw test. You can do this at home. So if you have somebody you're worried with and you can get them to do it. Like my mom now knows what the clock draw test is. It makes her very mad and she will not do it for any provider. She, she just, her excuse is, I am not an artist, I don't know how to draw and I'm not gonna draw that clock because her clock is way off. And uh, what you do is you say, I want you to draw a clock and I want you to put the numbers in from one to 12 and I want you to put the hands at 1150. So for my mother, one through 12 goes between 12 and six. There's nothing on this half of the clock, okay? And then her hands, one's like this and one's like this, they're not even connected, right? When the clock is off, something's off up here. And that is a very um, significant and specific tool for screening for Alzheimer's. And I use that in my office a lot, as if somebody brings someone in and that they're concerned about, then I'll do the lab work. Um, there's PET scans. PET scans are about $4,000. Insurance generally won't pay for them. Um, what PET scans look for is something called amyloid plaques. And that is diagnostic for Alzheimer's. There's, they're like plaques and tangles in the brain. Um, I don't know. There's been a large study that was done, and what they found when they um, PET scanned people was that many people who were on dementia medications actually did not have the plaques. They didn't have dementia. They had something else. So, you know, if there's more studies done like that, maybe at some point um, that will become a test that will be covered that can be used for diagnosis. You get on medicine, you don't. You've got something else going on. You don't have Alzheimer's. And then finally, there's genetic testing. And so genetic testing is a tough thing too because there is something called the APOE gene that is related to Alzheimer's. However, just because you have the gene does not mean you'll get the disease. It is multifactorial. So there's the gene, there's environment, and there's lifestyle, and all three factors come together. Um, people who exercise cardiovascularly, three, no, 30 minutes, five times a week, have much less risk of Alzheimer's. People who work longer, keep their mind busy, right? They're thinking, they're creating new connections in their brain. Their risk for Alzheimer's will be less, even if they have the gene. Now, what is different about that is if you have, um, an early onset of Alzheimer's, say 50 years old, before 65, so if you have someone in their 50s in your family that had Alzheimer's, then probably that genetic test for you is going to mean more because you had early onset Alzheimer's in your family. So that's why you can't just go out and genetically screen everybody because what does it really mean? And then people worry and they may never develop the disease, just like a lot of the genetic tests that are out. So this are just, again, kind of summarizing the uh, de deficits in Alzheimer's disease. We've talked about long-term memory loss, which is in the late, late stage, because we, we talked about the uh, early memories, those go away more quickly. The late memories tend to stay. Um, aphasia, so trouble speaking. Um, there's something called word salad, where they just spit a bunch of words out, makes no sense. They know what they're saying. They're, and I'm sure they know what they're saying in here, but you do not know what they're saying because none of their words make sense. Um, apraxia, so the inability to walk, that comes in that late stage, or, or the end of the middle stage. The neurons in the brain, it depends on how much of their brain is literally missing, and I'm gonna show you a picture in a minute, as to what it is affecting with their body. And then of course that executive functioning, that decision making, the organizational skills, the planning, those kinds of things. So here is an MRI, and you can see the normal brain on the left. And when, these are the ventricles. I wish I had a pointer. These are the ventricles that hold the fluid in your brain. That's normal. This is all of the, this is the frontal part of the brain where your executive function happens. 
this is all back here balance this is a cerebellar area so all of vision this is all very normal okay this is mild cognitive this is my mom's brain right now so you can tell wow she's got a lot less matter to work with and the red means lots of cognitive thought going on. You see how that's kind of missing in that frontal cortex up there. This is Alzheimer's disease. Literally, big chunks of their brain are missing. So you can see what we mean when we say the neural connections aren't there anymore. They're not being made. This is kind of another graphic. Um, thinking about we're going to talk about this with pharmacology, but um, think of the brain being on fire with Alzheimer's. Think of this as smoldering. Think of this as starting to burn. And this is, it's literally on fire when you're missing these chunks. If we could identify people right here and get them on drugs like Aricept and Namenda, things that slow the progression, we could probably buy them a lot of time but largely we catch people here. And we, and we try to maintain them for as long as we can, but it might be a year, it might be two years, but because it's, it's, a, it's a slope, and it's a long slope down for Alzheimer's. For vascular dementia, it's like a stair step. They'll be, they'll be at this level, all of a sudden something happens, there's a drop. And now they're down here, and it's significant, you notice it, and here, you know? versus Alzheimer's that it's just a very gradual decline so over years. And Pardon me? What's the, difference the difference is vascular is in people who have had strokes. They're, they've had vascular insults to their brain and most of them will have Alzheimer's along with it because they're now 80, 85 years old but um, so sometimes they, as they stair step down, they've had another insult to the brain. It might even be a micro, like a mini stroke, but it just takes them down. Or an infection, you know, they get really sick and they drop down. They're in the hospital, they get confused in the hospital, delirium, and they never recover to back where they were, you know. Yeah. So these are some of the behaviors. Um, the lady with the cane. Man, some of them scare me. And I have like, when I was uh, rounding, I, I don't round in the nursing homes anymore, but I really like kept the door to my back. I, I, you know, you only get so close when you know you have people that can get agitated and strike out. And I'm telling you what, these nursing assistants, they do tough work. I can't even tell you. Their job is so hard but it's also dangerous they get hit and they get punched and um, and it, it's just a tough thing um, psychosis so paranoid like just thinking that people are talking about you or people are stealing things out of your room versus persecutory somebody's trying to kill me somebody's trying to stab me um, that happens with um, not so much Alzheimer's but with dementia in general, but it can happen because you can have that mixed disease with vascular component or Parkinson's disease, lots of, and we'll talk about that, lots of delusions with Parkinsonism. Um, agitation, so that wandering, physical aggression, like if somebody's really in it and they're in their wandering zone, you're really not going to stop them. You just go walk with them, you know, you just walk with them and you kind of direct them like, hey, star, let's just, let's go back over here and let's look at this, okay? You just you just go with it. That's, that's what you do. You don't try to talk them out of it. Um, agitation can be a lot of things, though. It can be because they've got a urinary tract infection. That's the first thing I think about with a behavior change in a dementia patient is an infection of some sort, urinary tract primarily, especially in women. Um, it can also be pneumonia. could be that they're in pain and they can't tell you because a lot of times their, their joints get locked up. And those nursing assistants or family members even go to change them or move them and they don't tell them what they're going to do. Or even if they do, they're telling them at the same time they're doing it and it hurts and they strike out, you know. Or they can't see, you know. Um, we see out to here, right? Our per peripheral vision is out to here. When you hit about 70, many, many times your per peripheral vision is about here. And now when you're 80, maybe you're about here. 
especially if you have cataracts and you're a little clouded and you're sitting in a wheelchair and somebody comes up behind you and puts their hand on your shoulder, hey, Fred, how are you? And they're, ah, oh, they're screaming, you know, and you're like, what's the matter with them? Versus just going around that wheelchair and getting right in front of their face, even if you have to kneel down, get right in front of their face. And then you touch their knee or their shoulder and like, how are you? So how you approach these people makes a huge difference. And that's where the training in the nursing homes needs to come in. And it doesn't always. It's, it's a huge deficit. And then the sleep disturbance. I mean, there's sundowning. A lot of them are just up all night and they want to sleep all day. And so you've got to work with that. I want you to see this video. It's about seven to eight minutes. I want you to get a feeling for how it feels to have Alzheimer's, okay? This would be like a middle stage Alzheimer's. More than five million Americans live with Alzheimer's disease. It's a long, hard road, not just for those who suffer from the disease, but also for the caregivers, children tasked with caring for an increasingly dependent parent. Four years ago, ABC had the chance to put cameras inside a Texas home as a couple took on this terrible challenge. And my co-anchor, Cynthia McFadden, has followed the family ever since. Cynthia? Terry, one of the things we learned over these years is just how little most of us really understand about the disease itself. I thought I knew a lot about Alzheimer's. But after Blaine and I took part in an experiment simulating what it's like to have the disease, I found out I didn't. It was 12 minutes that changed my life. Blaine Wilson's mother, Lawanda, came to live with him four years ago. He just married his new wife, Georgia, five weeks earlier. Blaine soon learned it was much harder than he thought. Oh, God. Blaine! She's going to grab her car. And later, she did. She lit fires. She wandered off. But Lawanda doesn't look sick, and she often seems fine, which makes it hard for Blaine and Georgia to understand how limited she really is. And that leads to frustration and resentment. Just tell her to wash her throat. I'm tired of washing. I bet she could have better. She knows what to do. But she doesn't. Are you afraid? I mean, no, I'm not afraid. You know what I mean? It's my mother. You don't understand. The more we watched the tapes, the more it became apparent how little Blaine and Georgia really understood what was happening to Lamont's mind. Do you really feel you understand the world your mother now lives in? No. What's going on in her head, her brain? I have no idea. I, do. I have no idea. I need to understand that. I need to know what it's like. So I told Blaine about an experiment developed by P.K. Bevel and administered by her colleague, Lori Labershack. The experiment helps families and caregivers actually experience what it's like to have Alzheimer's. I understand that's a pretty rough experience. It, it needs to be experienced. If it'll help me to understand, uh, I would love to. I agreed to undergo the experiment with him. Could you have a seat, please? Our journey into another world begins here, in this bedroom, where Blaine and I are suited up with some deceptively harmless-looking devices. Goggles simulating macular degeneration, glaucoma, and cataracts, conditions that older people with Alzheimer's often have. Likewise, latex gloves are placed on our hands, and our fingers are taped to make our hands feel arthritic, clumsy, hard to bend. Remove your shoes. A substance is placed inside our shoes to make it harder for us to walk. That is uncomfortable. And on our heads, they place earphones, which emit an incessant jabbering, a clamor of noise that some Alzheimer's patients say is constant. Individuals with dementia say we're hearing all this stuff, and they can't turn it off. Then we're each given five tasks to perform, and only 12 minutes to accomplish them. I'd like you to find the tie and put it on. I can't hear you. Blaine has a hard time concentrating from the start. Your time begins now. As he enters, Blaine is immediately disoriented. He staggers, reminding us of the way his mother looked on our tapes. Blaine tries to accomplish his first task, clearing the dishes off the table. <coughs> But when he goes to put them away, he can't find the kitchen. 
so he gives up. <coughs> Blaine finally finds the kitchen, but he can't remember why he's there. And again, the similarities to his mother were astounding. She had old cabinets, and then she would shut them. Mother, what are you doing? Nothing. But Blaine is doing a lot better than I am. What the heck is this? It's only about two minutes into the experiment, and the noise from the headset is driving me crazy. Dad! So annoying! As I try to accomplish my first task of finding a white sweater, I work myself into a frenzy. White sweater. Remember, what I'm hearing is this. No. Believe me, it drives everything else out of your head. Annoyed! This is tough. I felt confused, kind of panicked. If I had to go through very much of that, it just might go crazy. All right, that's not a sweater. That's not a white sweater. When you do understand why people start talking to themselves, this is not a white sweater. I was trying to organize my mind by saying, OK, OK. OK, all right, all right, all right. Not a white sweater. Not there. I don't know about that. <sighs> You're doing great. PK was in the room, and at one point when I sat down in frustration on the sofa, and she said, um, you're doing great. Why don't you start with finishing setting the table? And she didn't tell me what else I was supposed to do. I'll remember that. The reinforcement. Yeah, because you feel so alone. And you feel so frustrated, and there's no, you know, you, you don't know what you're supposed to do, and it's so dark. Reluctantly, I go back into the kitchen to try to find the plates. Glasses. How long have I been doing this? About 20 hours? I'm not doing great. I'm not doing great. And once again, I get distracted and go looking for that white sweater. This looks good enough. This is like a, okay, it's not exactly a sweater. For the sake of time, I'm going to pass that. But can you, yeah, you, you kind of understand, right? I saw that like, oh my gosh, that helps so much to understand why things are so crazy, or they appear so crazy for people that have problems with their brain like this. Um, for sake of time, I'm going to speed up a little bit. So we talked about things you can do to prevent physical exercise, nutrition, sleep. So genetics is not everything. And that is true with all of these chronic diseases. I don't care if you're talking about diabetes, whatever. There's ways we can take care of ourselves to prevent. But sleep is huge now. You guys all know we need seven to nine hours of sleep. Everybody does. People that get more and people that get less every night are at risk for chronic disease, all kinds of things. So drug therapy, I've mentioned it a couple times. Um, there's two classes of drugs right now, really. There's more types, uh, more name brands than this, but I put up Aricept, I put up Namenda. Uh, they can be used in combination. They do not cure it. They do, not, they do not stop it. They hopefully prolong them at the stage at which they're started and they still have a decline, okay? And they're still worth starting. Sometimes I've started people at the late middle stage because sometimes it will help the behaviors. Even if it doesn't save the memory, it helps the behaviors. Um, psychoactive drugs are used, such as antidepressants, because there's a lot of depression in these patients, and those can help behaviors. Um, atypical antipsychotics. I wanted to talk to you guys about that for a minute. So things like Seroquel, Risperdal, uh, Zyprexa, Bilify, they're used because when people are having delusions and paranoia and psychosis, um, that's what those drugs help people who are like bipolar and schizophrenic, that's what those drugs do. And we see them help uh, the dementia patients. The problem is they have cardiotoxicity associated with them. So cardi cardiovascular disease, you could die of heart attack with them. But in my mind, like if it was my mother and she gets to that point where she's having behaviors, I want her to have quality. I don't want to be, have her up wandering around and getting up and out of her chair like every, like she can't even sit there crying constantly or yelling out. Like I want my mom to have some peace. And if that means personally for me that the drug would cause a heart problem that would take her sooner, okay. You know, but she could have some calmness and be able to sit with people and be able to eat her food, be able to rest at night. I will tell you this, the, the state has a lot of control 
over these nursing homes and prescribers like me because I would put somebody on it and it's not like being out in a family practice office. I put somebody on it, I get them where they need to be, the nursing home is scrutinized and they've got to have behavioral meetings every month. And once they've been on that drug for three months, you've got to evaluate it. And if, if they're not having behaviors anymore, you need to start decreasing the dose. I'm like, I had such a problem with that because um, you, know, you decrease the dose and you get them off of it and they might, some will do okay for a long time. Some go right back and it's very hard to get them back under control then. But um, that is the problem with nursing facilities and the state and it's really the state dictating what we can do. Um, that's my own little soapbox. But vascular, so as a family member, let me give you some power. You can say to that nursing home, put it in the chart. I want my loved one left on their antidepressant. Do not stop that no matter what. Or I want them left on their Zyprexa. You are not to stop that. The state comes in, you know, the, the nursing home can still get penalized, but a lot of nursing homes will say, we're gonna support the family if you will agree to do this. Um, <clears throat> just wanna know you have some power. So vascular dementia, well, I've talked about it, so I won't go into a lot of deep, deep uh, Detail. I've talked about the stepwise decline in relation to the Alzheimer's, which is a steady decline. So this is a CT scan of stroke. Um, you can see the white areas here. You see how these ventricles are still normal size, right? This is still a normal size, actually. Now this was, this was probably a huge bleed here, and that's missing. That's a severe stroke right there. But you can see all these little white spots out here. These are like these mini strokes that you hear people talk about. They may or may not have symptoms with it. That is why it is so important to control blood pressure and for people to take their blood pressure medicine. And when a provider says, oh, you need to go on some blood pressure medication, I'm, you know, well, no, I think I can control it, and, but you're running around with 150, 160 over 90, <coughs> you may be getting these little, not many strokes per se, but little defects in your brain that's gonna affect you 20, 30 years from now. So it's better to prevent disease than to end up with something like this later. Um, same meds used for vascular dementia in regarding the memory component and the behaviors as you find used for Alzheimer's. A little bit of, um, as a provider, like I know there's certain drugs that might cause more agitation, not in an Alzheimer's patient, but in a, for Namenda, for example, in a vascular dementia patient. So I may not use that one. Um, so there are some differences there, but generally there's just not a lot of options to choose from. Pseudobulbar affect. How many of you have ever heard of that? Seen the commercial on TV where people are crying for no reason. These are people that have had stroke, but this can also happen in mid, mid to late Alzheimer's, not late. So the whole middle stage of Alzheimer's or vascular dementia. And it's, it's these people who are constantly wanting to get up, constantly trying to get up out of their wheelchair. They're crying, but, but they're not sad. They'll, you ask them what's wrong, nothing's wrong. I don't know, and they're just crying. Any repetitive behavior, if you have that in your loved one, mention this drug, um, Nudexta, because it can work wonders. It's Robitussin, basically. Robitussin with a little quinidine added to get it across the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and um, nursing homes are still like, oh, I think we gotta decrease that. I'm like, no, we do not need to decrease that. But that is miserable for patients. It's very distressing for family members to see their loved one crying all the time and nothing's wrong. So don't be afraid to have that treated in your loved one. If you see it in your loved one, um, mention it to somebody. If a nurse says, well, I don't know why they're crying. They, just, they do this all the time. Say, could they have PBA? Let's, let's try something for it and let's see if it helps. And you gotta give that drug 12 weeks to know it's full effect takes a while. That's the only drug out there to treat that. And people will treat it with many, many, many other things um, because they don't think about pseudobulbar affect, which is PBA. Uh, there's dementia with Lewy body. This happens in Parkinson's disease. And the hallmark of it is hallucinations, seeing things that aren't there. Um, tremors, of course, you guys know all of that. But the, the hallucinations are usually visual with Parkinson's disease. They're really seeing things that are not there. And you know, you can ask people, I, I ask them when I evaluate them, are, have you been having any hallucinations? And 
I had a patient, he would say, yeah, I thought there was a snake over in that corner. It really scared me. And, it, and I see it like three times a day or something, you know, and they, they know, a lot of them know that what they're seeing isn't real, but it scares them to death or it makes them nervous or causes anxiety. Um, frontotemporal dementia is a hereditary form. It's not very common, like 5 to 10% of patients, but it hits very early, 40, 50 years old. And the mem it doesn't affect the memory so much. It's disinhibition. Like they say things that are rude or sexual or whatever, and they have no, no thought about it. And that's different. That, that's not like they were their whole life. This is a different thing. Let's see here. If I can get this to move forward again. And I talked about the atypical antipsychotics for dementia. Um, I talked about acute behavior change. Think about infections, think about pain, think about a new medication that's been added and they're having a side effect to it in their brain because their brains aren't going to act like yours and mine do now. Um, and just a decline in the disease process. Maybe, maybe there's nothing else going on. They're just getting worse. All right. Psychosis. I think the one thing I wanted to talk about here <clears throat> is, and I've mentioned it before, when they're having delusions, you, again, you cannot change their mind. So what you do is you redirect them. You try to get their mind off of what they're thinking about by changing the subject, changing the room that they're in, walking them someplace else. Um, there's a lot of depression in uh, dementia patients as well. I think it's under-recognized and under-treated. And so think about that. Music therapy is, is huge in Alzheimer's disease and in all forms of dementia, but especially Alzheimer's. And I don't know why nursing homes don't play music. Some nursing homes um, I, I have been to, and, and this is some of the family members, will get um, like iPods for their loved one. And it personalized music is best. So it's generally music from their generation. It, it actually helps them make memory connections. It's calming to them. And so there's lots of studies that if you will play some background music, that they will, the cognition will actually improve for that period of time. Not, not long term, but while the music is being played. They studied undergraduate, college students, same thing. Cognition improves with background music. But it's uh, usually um, like generational type music, whatever you're used to and you liked, or um, I don't know, like Mozart, Beethoven, those kind of uh, songs are really good for this type of therapy as well. Um, it's a wonder, I wish nursing homes would have music therapy departments. They really do need to, but I'm sure it's a budgetary thing. Anxiety, lots of anxiety in these patients, and that needs to be treated because that causes agitation causes them not to sleep, causes them to have problems that family members get called about. Or if you're taking care of them at home, it's very stressful when they're anxious because they're not going to sleep and they're up wandering. And um, interestingly, if caregivers are anxious, then they're going to make their loved one anxious. So it's kind of a back and forth effect. This wandering, though, that, that's a really hard thing, right? Because if they're at home, somebody's got to almost be up with them 24-7. Because some people will wander for 24, 36 hours nonstop. I had one lady that would do that. Go, 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 go. And then lay down and sleep for 24 hours. And get up and do it all over again. And it took a lot of time to figure out what medication would help her. We finally got it figured out, but it took a long time. She came in on one of those emergency admissions because her husband could not handle that. And who could? Um, typically, they need a locked unit when they're wandering because they got to know if they leave. You know, something you do when people are wandering, like this door here, like they'll know it's a door. They can, they're going to try to get out, right? A lot of times they keep coming to the door. But if you put a nice picture up of like a library with bookcases, they're not going to try to get out here because they don't know it's a door anymore. Now they think it's a bookcase. So you can do things like that that are really creative, even in your home, to help. Like, don't leave your keys laying around because they're going to see them. I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go see Irma. I'll be back. You know, like Irma's probably been gone for a long time, right? Um, so don't leave your purse out. Things that will make them think that they need to go because they can still think on that level. Um, do, how much time do we have? Five minutes, right? Um, 
I'm not, that was just stuff I already talked about, so I'm not going to show you that. Agitation, yeah, agitation is tough because it can be unrelenting and go on and on. And it can be in the form of just being angry and agitated all the way to punching and hitting and kicking. And some of it has to do with the things I talked about, them being afraid, them being startled, them being in pain. But sometimes it just is. And it's something that those atypical antipsychotics I talked about might need to be used to help. Because if you've done all the behavioral modification and they're still like that, they're dangerous to people. They don't mean to be, but you know, these men that are six foot tall and 200 pounds, they land a punch. They're going to hurt whoever's taking care of them. And they do. I always hate it because they sure don't know it. You know, your loved one can become a different person that you never knew. You know, they, they can cuss and they never cussed. A, I told my son, I'm like, I'll probably get Alzheimer's and I'll probably cuss a, a blue streak because I never cuss. I'm like, you're going to just know that that's not me. Um, this is why I wanted to hit this before we left. Caregivers. Two-thirds of caregivers are women. And many of them are working, right? So they're still trying to bring money into their home, but now they've got to take care of their loved one, which they want to do. But it's so tiring. And what I see so many times is, oh boy, the daughter, the son has such a hard time because I <coughs> promised my mother I would never put her in a nursing home. I promised her. She made me promise her, whichever way it goes. And now you have this tremendous guilt because what, what am I going to do? I can't handle her at home. There's nobody else to help me. Um, I think uh, support groups are huge if people can find time to go, but at least plugging in somewhere, having some respite care if they're keeping that loved one at home, having someone come in. This is where churches are great. If churches would develop this ministry, come, but send someone in to, that the person knows, or hopefully, and stay with them three hours. So, so the family member can get out and go to the grocery in peace. Go to McDonald's and sit and have a Coke. You know, go visit a friend. Just have a little time to yourself. Um, interestingly, uh, depression, which you would probably expect, is more prevalent in caregivers. And another thing that can help that is just being informed, knowing what's going to maybe happen next. What, is, what do I expect with this disease can actually reduce some stress for caregivers. Um, caregivers, hopefully they will accept help, like we talked about. Um, support groups, take care of themselves. There's some research out now that caregivers have a very high risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes. It's the stress of it over a period of years. It increases the cortisol levels and they don't take care of themselves because I don't have time. I'm worried about my mom or my dad or I don't have anybody to watch them. So by the time mom and dad ends up dying or in long-term care, now the health of the person that took care of them is, is kind of shot. The other thing that can help is focusing on positive things, like finding one thing each day that went well with that loved one. Well, maybe it was the bath. Today the bath went really well. Uh, they let me give them one, you know. Um, that, that could be what went really well. The other thing that to think about, hopefully sooner rather than later, are the end of life issues. And, you know, when do you stop taking cholesterol medicine? My goodness, what point is it, for any of us, what point is it to take cholesterol medicine at 80 years of age? The, uh, the effect from that is 10 years out. So, like, I stopped my mom's cholesterol medicine. She knows it about, uh, she's 75, but probably about three years ago because she was having muscle aches and all. And you're like, you know what, I'm trying to prevent a heart attack in my mom when she's 85. Will she really live to be 85? I don't know, but it's not worth, and, and I'm not, uh, a, a naturalist at all. I, I believe that there's a place, like I would never stop a diabetes medication. But I, I've had patients where their family member has them on 10 different vitamins. Now it's hard for them to take pills anyway and they need their blood pressure medicine and their diabetes pill and probably some Tylenol for aches and pains and now their loved one's got them on 10 vitamins. And what are you really accomplishing with that, you know? Um, other than the stress of the nurse trying to get this patient to take there who is confused to take all of these pills every day but I understand it from the family members point of view they feel like they're doing something but 
but yet if they could see the stress that it causes, they might think differently about it. Um, so anyway, do you want a feeding tube in your loved one who has dementia? It's a very hard thing to decide not to feed your loved one when they get to that late stage. But you know what? You have to think, what am I doing long term? What am I doing this for? Feeding tubes are for people that have the potential to get better. And these patients don't have the potential to get better. So you're prolonging their suffering, really. Um, it's a hard thing to come to terms with, but it is true. Um, see here, hospice. Huh, when does hospice get involved? On average, about two weeks before somebody dies. Largely because patients, if they're with it, or family members will say, no way, no way, that means you're giving up on my loved one. I'm not going to do it. That is exact opposite of what it means. So hospice, you can come into hospice if you have uh, expected life expectancy of six months or less. However, you can be in hospice for five years once you're in it. And hospice doesn't mean you're not going to treat an infection with an antibiotic. It probably means that um, I mean, they're not going to do aggressive, aggressive stuff like send you in for CAT scans and MRIs and things like this. But if you had a bladder infection, they're going to treat it. But we need to get pay, uh, people to understand that hospice and palliative care is about quality of life for the time that's remaining. And so hopefully you guys can help get that message out to people. Um, that's it. Sorry, I'm like five minutes over. Thank you so much. Well, I don't want to keep them. Um, any questions that you guys have? Anything I can try to answer? Anything that was confusing? You know, um, my, my, actually, because my mother has mild cognitive impairment at the age of like 73, my risk, I don't know if, I, if she has a, the gene for it or not. For, so I don't know if she'll go on to develop Alzheimer's. Uh, but I, I figure my risk is probably equal to anybody else's because the genetic form of it is only about 5 to 10 percent of people and it's that early onset, you know, like age 60, 55, that kind of thing. Um, and then, then I might would want to know if I had that, I might would want to know if I had that gene, I think. Um, I don't know if that's helpful or not. But it's really hard to say, like, uh, like my grandmother had Alzheimer's, so did her um, almost all of her brothers and sisters, but all in their 70s to 80s. But I think about the fact that the lifestyle and the environment, I think, was a large part of that. So for me personally, like I exercise five days a week, I try to get good sleep, I, I plan to, you know, read and study. You know, versus uh, watching, listening to music, or listening to radio shows, uh, radio t uh, shows like from long ago where they're like gun smoke. Do you know that creates new brain connections in your brain versus watching TV? Because the picture's already there for you. You don't have to think about it. But if you're listening to something, you're creating mental pictures, whether it's music, people talking. So I do a lot of that kind of stuff. And I think that we can all do that to help prevent. It's the best we can do. Have you guys heard of Blue Zones? Okay, there's a book called Blue Zones. There's about, it's either six or eight. <coughs> seven. seven. Is it seven? Okay, she's got it. Seven, I knew I was in the area. It's been a while since I read the book. Seven areas in the world where people live to be like 100 years old, maybe 110. They don't have dementia. They're up walking. They're even, some of them are even working uh, in, their, in their gardens. What is the difference? The difference is lifestyle, and it is. It's diet. Uh, Loma Linda, California is one of the blue zones and it has to do with Seventh-day Adventists who don't drink, they don't smoke, they eat a well-balanced diet, they exercise, and they live a long, healthy life. Japan, I think it's Japan, is one. Um, Okinawa, yes, it's Okinawa. Um, India, I don't know if India is a blue zone. And the diets are different in these countries. They're not all the same, but yet they're, they're not heavy in bad carbs and snacks and, you know, all the things that we eat here. It's more like legumes and um, probably the, just the, the, the normal good diet that we should have. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I actually picked up a book here at this library about Alzheimer's. 
but a lot of the things they say in this book over and over again is what's good for your heart is good for your brain. True, because of the vascular piece yes. of that, yeah. So, but they also said, which was kind of scary, is that a lot of it begins your cognitive decline, um, and especially if you're not leading a great lifestyle, can be 30 or 40 years before you're you right. even see You're right. Symptoms. Can begin in your 40s. Yeah, so you have to think about this when you're young, you know, but yeah, definitely in the 40s it can happen. So, not that you develop dementia in your 40s, but, but, but the changes happen. So, staying away from greasy, fried, fatty foods, you know, all, like you said, all the things that are bad for your heart, which is so hard in our day and age. Another question. Is there like a website or um, other material that to better educate? Yeah, I would check out the Alzheimer's Association online. I think it's Alzheimer's, oh, let me see what my, I had a citation here for them, alzheimers.org. If you just Google Alzheimer's, and it, you'll, you'll come up and you'll find the Alzheimer's Association. They've got research on there, they've got information about support groups, they've all, all kinds of things. That's an excellent site. Anything that you would find on Mayo Clinic would be an excellent site as well. Um, Mayo Clinic, what would, would be another one? Cleveland Clinic, I think they have some stuff out there. Yeah. You know, sometimes de depression can, um, you can think a person has dementia, but they really have depression. When you treat it, they get better. Yeah, I, don't, I would think stress can do a lot of things. Stress is the underlying cause of most of our chronic disease. And uh, I'm going to get off topic a minute here because it's huge to me. Have you heard of the ACE? study or ACEs. It's the Adverse Childhood Event Study that was done back in like 1998 by Kaiser Permanente and they surveyed 9,000 of their employees with, it's a 10 question questionnaire that we as providers really need to do this in our practice to every patient that walks through the door no matter the age. The outcome of this study is that when we go through stress as children growing up divorce of, a, of our parents, a loss of a parent, um, abuse of physical, emotional, sexual, um, use, not just a one-time stress and it's done, but we're talking chronic stress. What we now know in children, those children's brains are smaller than children that don't come from those stressful environments. So, so a 10 question questionnaire, if you have a score of four or higher. So four uh, being you answered four questions positively and you can Google ACE, A-C-E questionnaire. Um, we know that that means an increased, uh, a shortened lifespan and an increase in chronic disease which leads to the shortened lifespan. Chronic disease being diabetes, cardiovascular disease, substance abuse, smoking, all of these things, depression, anxiety, um, be, and the chronic disease comes from the fact that this child is under stress for years, right? Their parents are separated, they're fighting, whatever is going on, which produces cortisol and adrenaline. So this brain is soaked in adrenaline constantly, right? Which changes their neural synapses and changes their ability to learn. It affects them forever. And if you think about this, it's really scary. If you think about this, it's probably 80% of households, right? That I came from that kind of environment myself. And I think I look at myself, I'm telling you too much history, but I have prediabetes. I have hypertension since I was 35. I went and had a heart score done just because a friend did last year, and I had plaque buildup. I'm 54. Plaque buildup in one of my main arteries. And I eat right. I exercise. I don't have anybody in my family that's had heart attack, stroke. I have parents with high blood pressure. But I really think... I really think those adverse childhood events, long term for me, even though I'm like, like I love life. I'm a highly functioning, we got a great family. I don't have problems that you might expect I should have from what I came out of. But I think physically it has affected me long term because of those cortisol levels I probably experienced for six years um, through the stress of everything in my family. Um, you know, and, and you can you can do your best to change some of that, but now I just control the things that I can control, and and I think that's true for all of us. But it is huge, and I think us as providers taking that study 
And if you came into my office and you're having depression, you know, instead of me saying, um, why are you depressed? You know, like, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm working three jobs and I can't pay my bills and my husband left or I don't know what the circumstances would be. You know, maybe I can say, help me understand when did you not feel depressed? When did you first become depressed? What was happening back then? Especially if I've done the ACE questionnaire and I could say, boy, I see that your parents divorced when you were 14. Were you depressed back then? You know, that, that can be a huge, and just letting you talk about it, maybe you've never talked about it before, um, that, can, that can provide some healing, even like a 15 minute time period in a visit. So I don't know why we're talking about this, other than I think it's so <laughs> exciting. I, because you ask about depression and anxiety and stress, and stress does so much stuff to us, well, right? Hopefully most of us are good enough about checking the labs, doing a, screen, a depression screening questionnaire, um, not, most people a lot of times can't afford the neuropsych visitor. They don't even have access to one. There are some here in Fort Wayne though. There's a couple. Um, that's always a good thing to do. But those screening tests, especially the mini mental exam, it's pretty specific. That's a, like a score of 30. 27 to 30 is normal. It's asking you like spell the word world backwards. You know, um, I'm going to say three things and I want you to repeat them and then I'm going to ask you five minutes later what those three things are. So it's that kind of test. It's about 20 questions. And so you're, you're doing those kind of things with your people too. So I don't think anybody would just put somebody on Aricept without checking to make sure that there's not well, depression. There's a cognitive decline, but there could be cognitive decline that's not Alzheimer's. Sure, <laughs> sure. This is the hard thing. This is the hard thing. Well, the bottom line is, yeah, I, I don't think, why do tangles and plaques develop in some people? Well, there's that genetic piece. So I don't, we don't have the answer. That's the answer. We don't have the answer. But the longer, I, I've been an NP for about 23 years now. So the longer I practice, the, the lo more I know that everything is interrelated. You don't just have hypertension. You probably, there's a lot of other things that feed into that. And then when you think about that whole ACE study and like, all these factors that contribute to that. Well, that's why you wonder, is it really like a U.S. lifestyle that is leading to our... I don't know. I've lived abroad. I've lived in Nigeria for a couple of years. I've traveled a lot and done a lot of work. I will say there's depression in those countries. There's certainly there's dementia in those countries, but... Um, it's a chemical contamination. You know? I, I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I don't... I wonder, you know. Yeah, their lifestyle... The more, um, and there's research on this, the more their diet becomes westernized, the more health problems they develop with the chronic disease, the cardiovascular stuff, the diabetes. Like Nigeria is a fairly wealthy country, the top 5% of the population. The rest eat one meal a day. But once they become, if they have the ability to become wealthy, um, so to speak, and their diet changes, and now they, um, they're experiencing the need for cardiac bypasses and things, which really can't happen in their country. So I was, that was like seven years ago when I lived there. But um, they're like, we, the, the director of the National Hospital said, we should not have these problems. Now our people need cardiac catheterizations and stents. And, you know, so, yeah, they're, but they still have depression. But they look at life differently, like as far as depression and things, because over there, like death is a part of life. Right. Here, we do everything we can to avoid death. Like, keep it over there. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. There's nothing worse than death. And for them, you know, if they have five kids, maybe two of them don't even live to be five years old. So it, it is. It's, it's, they, but I'm not saying they don't get depressed and they don't get anxious because they do. But they have a different outlook. A lot of the world does than, than we do sometimes. And we've got a lot. They have stress. We have a lot of different stress. Like their stress is, um, is somebody going to break into my home and take everything I have tonight? And our stress is, I've got a mortgage that I can't pay. I've got a credit card bill of $20,000. My kids are on drugs. You know what I mean? We got, we got all of this other stuff from a westernized civilization that they don't deal with so much. They're both not good, but it's kind of like... I think I'd rather have this than not have electricity and not have, you know. <laughs> um, I think providers now are much more aware and much more quick to screen with clock draw tests because we know these things now. 
with clock draw tests and many mental exams, if there's any hint of things not being right. I think, um, I think family members are more informed, there's more information out, but I still think it's, it's so easy to rationalize things and things get postponed for a long amount of time. Just, you know, even to the point of people aren't safe driving their car and, and no family member wants to make that decision because it's very hard, um, but it's crucial. And if, yeah, if we could help family members understand, wow, bring them in, it might be a battle, but bring them in and let's at least rule things out and let's take it a step at a time. You know, we rule this out and then we have a conversation. Like with my mom, um, I wanted her to go on some memory medication. So I don't call it dementia medication or Alzheimer's medication. You have to term things right, you know. Um, she was having uh, some stomach problems and so we didn't go there because um, that drug can make you nauseated, some people. And she already has a lot of trouble with nausea. She really, she was willing to take it, but we just, you know, decided at this point, maybe it's not good for her because she's already, she just doesn't, can't afford to lose any more weight. But the, yeah, the earlier you start, the better. And I just think those conversations, they're really, they're really tough. Um, and it's hard when they don't make good decisions and you have to step in and say, I'm gonna take over your finances. You have to do that very gingerly Although some are just willing to, okay, here you go. I mean, it's a relief to bring up the topic, you know, so. Well, I don't, the occupational therapist, I had me finding out there was one for driving that would do a driving. There he is. You, was great. There, you know what? The doctor didn't have to tell her. The bad thing is, is like, I, I wanted my mom to have that. It's expensive. Yeah, it was yeah. 300 Yeah, they're about 400 bucks. Per year that, no. Some physical therapy uh, places will do it. Out, Auburn has a physical therapy group that will do that as well. And it is good because it does take the weight off of the family member versus waiting for them to have a car accident. And I was not, and when my grandmother was bad enough, I was living in Georgia. Um, and so my cousin was here. And my father and her mother, the two children, just totally didn't want to, anything to do with it. They loved her, but I like, couldn't deal with it. And so by the time, my grandmother went out of her home in a police car, this is terrible. And she had been sitting in her car in the garage for hours because she thought space aliens were in her home. And you could see like the paint was off the edge of the car, the door frame of the garage. She had hit it several times. And my, my father and his sister ignored it because it was easier. So my cousin, when she find out, found out, you know, she was like 40 at the time, she had to, the only way she could get my grandmother out was she had to call the police and they had to take her out. And how embarrassing, like my mother, my grandmother was a, a really well-known realtor here for many, many years, very dressy lady. And to go out looking like a wild woman in a police car when it could have been done so much better had her children had courage and to do a hard thing and step up and say, Mom, you can't live here anymore. You know, we are going to go do this now. And here, I'm going to take you to these couple of places and you look, and then we'll decide which one you're going to go to. Assisted living, you know, um, which is where she ended up. She was only stayed for like six months because she was so far gone. But then she went on to the nursing home. So I think that's it, Mark, though. I think it's doing. Uh, I think we are called in our life many, many times to do hard things, to do hard things, and that's a hard thing. But we can't turn our head away from it, put our head in the sand. Preaching to the choir was hard. <laughs> Thanks.